Welcome to Stone Cold Strows. I'm Brandon Strange alongside Charlie Palillo and Josh Jordan. Follow them on X at Palillo and at Josh Jordan 975 and read their work on sportsmap.com. Click like on the video if you think the Astros are inevitable and subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. If you're a Texans fan, the three of us are doing live reactions following every game this season for our Texans on tap podcast, including this Saturday after Rams Texans. If you missed our breakdown of Giants Texans, you can find that on our other YouTube channel, Sports Map Texans, or in audio form at all your favorite podcast apps just by searching Texans on tap. Gents, a look in the past. June 18th, the Mariners had a 10 game lead over both the Astros and Rangers following the White Sox series this weekend, which was exactly two months later. The Astros find themselves four games up on Seattle as we record this in the division and uh, are closer now record-wise to the Orioles in the standings than the Rangers are to Houston, if you can believe that. June 18th was also the day that Justin Verlander was placed on the IL. Ten days prior to that, Kyle Tucker landed on the IL, and that was after losing both Christian Javier and Jose Arquiti. The Astros have made this climb without so many of their weapons and then drunk on power or more likely pragmatism Sunday, Joe Espada filled out one of the most disrespectful lineups of the year, daring the worst team in the league to beat the Sugarland space Cowboys and Framber Valdez. And they could not two more impressive outings from Hunter Brown and Framber Valdez uh, over the weekend. Eric Getty suffered a hiccup on Friday, but given the stretch of pitching from Houston and the limited outings we've seen of Kikuchi and what appears to be an imminent return of JV to this staff. How confident are you now that Houston has the arms to finish the deal down the stretch? Well, if the Mariners are done winning any series, uh, the Astros don't even have to play at an elite level at this point. The degree of turn, you know, 180 and then some. The two-month stretch that you mentioned, the Astros about four games better than the Minnesota Twins, who have the second-best record in the American League, June 18th through August 18th, so two months in a day. The only team worse than the Mariners over those two months in a day, the White Sox, who shouldn't even count. Very possibly the worst team in Major League Baseball post-1900. White Sox 11-40, and 40, Mariners 19-30. and 30. So just uh, the perfect exacta. For the Astros to be the best team in the league for a longer stretch than the Astros were about the worst team in the league, you know, 12 and 24. Uh, and, and the Mariners, you know, the additions to the offense are only doing so much. Uh, if the Astros wind up winning this division, at which point they're now a solid favorite, the hay is not anywhere close to being in the barn. You look at the schedules and there's ebb and flow, right? The Astros have dumped series not within the last three or four series, but they've dumped series that you say, oh no, last September, a one and six homestand against the A's. And at that point, Wobegon Royals. Uh, there's a, a lot of water still to go under the bridge, but the Astros are in the command position to the extent that anyone assuming now, oh, the American League West race is over. Silly. But you now, rather than checking the rear view on Seattle, you can actually look down the road. Uh, the odds are against it. But the Astros now have a real shot at reeling in either the American League East champion or American League Central champion, right? The Yankees and Orioles start the week dead even. The Indians, a couple of games, or Indians, up oh, another quarter for the fine jar. The Guardians, a couple of games ahead of the Twins, right? Those top two seeds, they get to pass the lightning round, the best out of three, where your postseason can be over in a hurry. I don't care if you're the best team in baseball playing the White Sox. You know, you can lose two out of three, like that. Uh, so that's in reach for the Astros. So it's still a multi-front battle, but uh, they seem to have the better overall ammo than Seattle at this point. Uh, maybe we look back at this past week as, as the one where the Astros won the division or the Mariners lost the division. And the Astros taking two out of three from the White Sox at Minute Maid Park, that's not a good series. I mean, that's okay. It's somewhat handling business. Right? The White Sox don't win one out of every three games on average but they don't lose all three games uh, on average. Uh, but the Mariners got back-to-back -back games where starting pitchers went seven innings, gave up no earned runs, lost them both, uh, croaking away two games in Detroit. Then they go to Pittsburgh where the Pirates were on a 10-game losing streak when the Mariners get to town, and Seattle loses the first two games of that series. So Seattle's not bleeding. It's hemorrhaging. There is time, though, for the Mariners to salvage 
And the Astros, when we get to the schedule, it's a bit of a gauntlet. And these may be now the good Astros, but they have not been handling superior competition over the last five, six series. They are going to be challenged. If at the end of this, at Baltimore, at Philadelphia road trip, the Astros still have a four-game lead over the Mariners, uh, then we'll risk the election night early projection and call the division race over. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned it, Brandon. The pitching, the pitching's been fantastic, and that that's keeping them on all these games. But I am a little worried about the offense, especially as you prepare to play some better teams like the Orioles and Red Sox, number two and number three in OPS and baseball. So, are the Astros going to be able to hit enough, especially with we don't know what the deal is really with Bregman right now, and the bottom half of the order we know has just been pretty awful for, for a decent amount of time now at least Pena is starting to show you a little more power but for the most part you're you're just glad he's fast because he gets so many infield singles but I, I thought it was interesting they they did a thing on Bleacher Report about the the biggest red flags for each you know major league team this guy Zachary Reimer did his big red flag for the Astros and it was about Altuve's lack of power and in his first 80 games of the season, 473 slugging percentage. But since then, 353 slugging percentage. So he's only had seven extra base hits since uh, after the first 80 games of the season. So they speculate here maybe that hand injury is still kind of bothering Altuve when he got hit by that pitch and didn't participate in the All-Star game. So that's something I'm kind of looking at here because as you know, Bregman's dinged up and the bottom half of the order is not giving you much. You need Altuve to be one of those guys that pro provides you with some thump. And I see him, too, trying to bunt for hits a lot more often lately. I know he had the home run to, to give the Astros a little extra you know, room in you know, the end of the game against the White Sox in the finale, which was nice to see. But it wasn't like a huge blast. It's just kind of your typical Crawford box home run. So I just wonder, is something going on with Altuve here? Or are we going to see that, that thump come back to his swing? I don't buy the hand. Uh, something that, from frankly, the outset of the season was touched upon here. Espada has played Jose Altuve too much. He's 34 years old. Altuve is still a heck of a player. He's the best second baseman in the American League this season. Marcus Semien has him on war because Altuve's defense has eroded and Semien scores very well defensively. But I feel still think defensive evaluation could be a, a bit more nebulous uh, than the offensive side of the game. And, and Altuve is vastly superior to Semien offensively this season. But Altuve, the slippage is substantial, right? The OPS is under 800. The past two seasons, it was above 900. Uh, the power is part of that. The dog days of summer part of that. Altuve has already blown past his career high in strikeouts. He struck out 95 times already this season. He's on pace for about 125. Career high before last week, 91. So he's in a different phase of his career. It may become problematic over time as he starts a five-year, 20, uh, $25 million per year extension when he's about to turn 35 years old. But again, it's about the overall context. Altuve remains a legit all-star player but he absolutely is not close to superstar offensive output this season. He simply has not been. And when you get to your mid thirties, that's generally how it works. And since he started all, but a handful of games at second base this season, you know, I'm not going to say a spotter. You've royally screwed this up, but between he and Altuve, maybe at times penny wise pound foolish that, Oh, our chances are better with Altuve in the lineup every day. Of course. Um, and when the Astros stagger out of the starting gate, seven and 19, 12 and 24, they were just desperate. How could we possibly sit Altuve and, and play a grossly inferior offensive player, Dupont, or remember Greg Kessinger, anyone else they might have contemplated? Uh, but sometimes you have to pay the toll a little later down the road, and I think that's likely part of it with Altuve. Doesn't preclude him from catching a second wind and, and having a power jag, but he absolutely is not the player that he was in 2016, 2017, or 2022 and 2023. Not with this workload anyway. Yeah. And the offense has been a struggle. Like, you know, we know that the funk that Chaz has been in all season with no signs of pulling out of it. Uh, Jake Myers has been better, but not good. Uh, we've seen Joey Loperfito esque performances from the call ups with feasting early, followed by famine. Uh, again, too small of a sample size to really make any decisions definitively on what guys like Dezenzo or uh, Whitcomb are. And speaking of, Altuve's usage now with Bregman down, Espada just doesn't have that many levers to pull without sending out a Triple A lineup, as we saw on Sunday. Uh, Kyle Tucker continues to make 
slow progress, but optimism from the team aside, how far do you think this team can go without a Kyle Tucker, given the performances and question marks around all the other spots? Well, I'll tell you how wide the spectrum is. As presently constituted, this team can win the World Series. The point is to get into the tournament and then over three weeks, whatever happens, happens. And if you have superior starting pitching, a solid back end of the bullpen, and a bullpen in the Astros case, which will be fortified by a couple of starting pitchers moving into that bullpen, right? They're going to the six-man rotation now over this 18 games and 18-day stretch with Justin Verlander joining the rotation Wednesday. So again, we'll risk presuming for the sake of the discussion, the Astros are winding up in the playoffs. You do not need more than four starting pitchers, period, in a postseason series. In fact, the American League Division Series this year, game one, off day. Game two, off day. Game three, game four. And if it goes game five, between games four and five, off day. So you can stack a couple of your starting pitchers in multiple games. So I don't think they have any concern there. It's just about how you perform on a given day and in a given series. And can you grind out a 2-1 win, a 3-2 win if you need it? But that's where you have to at least put it in italics or, or a footnote. Right, Fromber now, the Astros are 10-0 and in his last 10 starts, ERA 240. Hunter Brown over his last 14 starts in ERA 2.33. Spectacular season-turning stuff. But the Astros' last six series, the White Sox are a complete joke, one of the worst offenses in the history of the sport. Two series against the Rays, who just cashed in their season before the trade line, just in time for the Astros to play them. The Pittsburgh Pirates, not good. The Texas Rangers' offense has collapsed this year. Right, No Phillies or Orioles, or Padres, or Diamondbacks in the group. All teams the Astros will be playing over the next month, and obviously near term, nearer term than that in the case of the Orioles and the Phillies. For me, I, I'm very confident in the pitching. Spencer Arigetti, I don't know. If we kind of jumped ahead a little bit last week, kind of putting him with Hunter Brown. I don't know if he's quite doing what Hunter Brown's doing this year, but you like what you see regardless. He's, he's on the right tra uh, trajectory. But looking at the offense once again, you know, this Red Sox series, you're going to have th uh, three right-handed starters for Boston. So with Dezenzo, he's gone four straight games without a hit after that home run against the Red Sox and Fenway. So I'm I'm wondering here, if you're going to have three righties in these games, is Singleton going to be starting? I mean, I know Singleton hadn't set the world on fire. He's, you know, a 230-235 hitter that give you some power. But, but that pitch what Dezenzo is doing I lately. I think gives you your answer. I bet she starts two of the three games. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too, Charlie. So I think that'll be something to watch. I I don't think this Singleton thing is over. I I think he's going to get some more opportunities here going forward. You know, I had a buddy of mine ask me, and I do not have the answer, right? It's wrong to pose a trivia question if you don't have the answer. I'm just posing the question. Uh, he asked me, has there ever been a team in first place in August that started three guys in its lineup that didn't even have 10 major league starts, right? Desenzo, the veteran of the group, uh, Pedro Leon, and then you have uh, Shea Whitcomb joining. So, you know, on the one hand, it's just flat out remarkable that they can continue to grind out wins. Uh, on the other hand, uh, thank goodness the Chicago White Sox uh, were in town for the weekend, and even there it was two out of three. But among the Astros' last four wins, they have wins three to two, two to one, and two to nothing. I mean, it's been a 98-pound weakling offense, but that's been enough to get lifting done. And, and just to tie up my own loose end, Brandon, you know, I mentioned the spectrum's wide. This team has constituted could win the World Series. They could also still miss the playoffs, right? They're a bad month away if Seattle gets hot, right? Just think of where the Astros were when they were 10 games out. Uh, the Astros stumble in September before the, the last week CPR to get them into the postseason. And so I mentioned the upside still is to, to get to skipping the wild card round. Uh, but, you know, you can go north. You can also go south. I mean, they're only a couple of games uh, ahead of the Red Sox. Uh, for the third wild card, which would, of course, presuppose Seattle winding up to to win the division. So uh, no counting chickens, uh, at least presumptively so. You know, there's there's reason to be optimistic, and you get Bregman back, so you at least have a top half of the lineup. Kyle Tucker, I'm completely, I'll believe it when I see it, when he's actually in the lineup and producing. But as we hit on last week, he does not have to be MVP candidate Kyle Tucker. He could just be average major leaguer Kyle Tucker, and that would be a significant boost to this Astros lineup which right now from four down with Bregman out is just weak. I mean, they had Jake Myers and Jeremy Pena in a cleanup spot you know, over the last few games. I mean, come on, how low can you go? But here they are, four games in first place. 
as we get to the, the last third of August and uh, just enjoy the ride, we do not know how the ride is going to finish yet. Yeah. And going back to possibly seeing Singleton more, at least he can walk. Uh, the moments aren't too big for him. And, uh, you know, just to hit on Arigetti, Arigetti is going to have hiccups in his development. He's up earlier than expected, but the real world experience he's getting right now and him still being able to uh, show filthy strikeout stuff, even in his down performances, is really, really encouraging. It should bode well for him next year. We can, he can come back with another, with a full year under his belt, real big league experience, and I think more uh, realistic, refocused expectations for him. I, you know, I want to close out on this because we had a question in our comment section last week that I thought was interesting. I have an opinion. I wanted to get your thoughts. Um, and for those watching, I haven't read it by this, uh, by the guys beforehand, this is off the cuff, but our commenter asked if the Astro success is given that they are that good, or it's just the division that bad. I think it's both. I think the Astros have paced alongside, uh, teams like the Padres and twins for the best record of the past couple of months. They're now Charlie, as you said, within striking distance of even that, uh, one of those final wild card spots, which would basically make the division conversation moot at this point. What are your What are your thoughts on the Astros being that good versus just being opportunistic in a bad division? Well, I mean, some things are absolute, but generally, if it's A, B, C, both of the above factors in, and it's absolutely the truth in this case. I mean, the Rangers' title defense completely unraveled. The A's, who actually we cited the June eighteenth through August eighteenth stat. Leading question, third best record in the American League the last two months in a day, the Oakland A's tied with the Red Sox. So sometimes it's when do you run into a team that the Mariners have seven games left with the A's, the Astros only have three. Well, maybe that's not such an edge on that particular criterion on the schedule uh, for, for the Mariners. Um, but, the, you know, the Angels are no good. So basically you're in a division, not counting yourself, with one team that's three games over 500 and three teams that stink. The American League West is obviously the worst division in the American League, it's not close. And so the Astros have had great fortune being in this division. If they would have played a lot more games against the Orioles, yes, they did sweep three from Baltimore the first time around, but the Orioles are good. The Rangers are not. Which team would you rather play 13 times versus seven, right? The Yankees or the Angels? Which team would you rather play 13 times? Which would you rather play seven, right? The American League Central, Cleveland is good. Minnesota is good. Beat the Astros in the season series. Kansas City is good. Swept the Astros three when they played. Detroit is not good, but the Tigers aren't terrible. Uh, you do have the Chicago White Sox. There's your one outlier. Uh, but as always, you play the course. Everyone knows the rules of engagement. But the Astros have played 680 baseball over their last 50 games, 33 and 17, uh, going into the, the Boston series. So, yeah, they had some things cut in their favor and needed them to. But they were 10 games out and made that up. You know, it wasn't just Seattle falling apart. The Astros had to play very stout baseball. But the schedule has played a role. And anyone denying that is, well, living in denial. The Phillies started this season 49 and 17 or 47 and 19. That was 700 baseball. Well, over their first 50 games, like 45 of them were against teams with losing records. Well, gee, once the schedule started to level off, so did the Phillies. That's how it works, and that's why baseball is your ultimate marathon, not a sprint sport. The water will find its level at the end of 162. Yeah, I agree with pretty much everything Charlie said there. I, I think now the team's really gelling, and I think a lot of that is getting past some injuries, You know, bringing in Kikuchi just to give everybody else a breather I think has made a big difference. I think that's been good. I'll just be curious, what do they look like when when and if Kyle Tucker comes back and you get Presley back and Bregman and and Verlander? Could could all these pieces kind of arrive at the right time for the final stretch of the regular season into the postseason? Obviously, that's what you hope for, but it's a good team. But early in the year, it was a two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. They, they'd show you the classic Astros and then they'd go drop a series where you're like, oh, come on, guys, what are you doing? They're a little more inconsistent early in the year. I think this is more who the Astros are that we're seeing right now. They just they need these reinforcements to come join them because the teams they're going to have to defeat in the playoffs, they can swing the bats. They can't just rely on pitching here 
when you get to playing the big boys at the end of the year. Yeah, and as good as their record is, since you brought up the Yankees, the Yankees have had their struggles this season. And if you're feeling down about how Houston's prospects have struggled in the bigs, well, look no further than Jason Dominguez and how he's looked for uh, New York when they called him up. He was called up uh, again over the weekends. Uh, he's their top prospect. They call him up. He goes over four and then has that double clutch where he can't uh, throw the runner out from the outfield on that assist and they lose the game. Um, so these teams go through these struggles. Uh, you know, you can only play the course that's in front of you. The Astros have played the course and so far the results have been good. We'll leave it there. That's it for part one of Stone Cultures. We'll have another video dropping Tuesday, so keep an eye out for that and possibly a bonus episode on Thursday. We haven't decided yet. Until then, Ghost Rose.